All right, uh, quick, what am I sitting in front of? It's a frog. <laughs> Come on, you can't tell what a frog butt looks like? That's a green frog, yay, okay. <laughs> we will continue this charade. It's wel welcome to everybody, and, and I know we'll get off mute here in a bit, but I got a few things to go over. Um, and there is a button on the bottom right that has a re it says reactions, and you can do something like this if you're like, yeah, I know the answer, or you can do something like that is nicely done. Okay, anytime. I'll keep my eyes off. Oh, thank you, uh, Sharon, and others who have already learned that skill. Um, so this is a, a delight to present um, for Tin Mountain, the frogs in New Hampshire. Um, to be honest, and this, I had to, to really research this because I've, as many of you know, I've done a few programs for Tin Mountain. And uh, for that matter, I've done a few hundred programs uh, since I started teaching at Antioch uh, back about 35 years ago. Um, nonetheless, I have never done one on frogs. Wow, I know. And if it wasn't for Nora, thank you very much, Nora. Um, I can't see you now because you're hiding, probably eating dinner. Uh, nonetheless, I have lots of pictures and lots of information. And I'm just going to try and confine it into this little space. There we go, right there. And see if we can't run through. I'll, I'll give you one tip though frogs, if you don't know anything about wildlife in New Hampshire, a great place to start. A great place to start. Why? Because there's only a handful of them. Now, if you really want to blow your mind, as I said to Katie Lewis yesterday, or was it the day before, Katie? Anyway, I get into insects because then you could spend every day, all day, 24 7 for the rest of your life and not even learn one genus of insects. Frogs, you can cover them all in a program, which is why I think Nora asked me to do the program on frogs, because let's face it, they're easy. Bullfrogs, I mean, come on, jog around. We know what bullfrogs look like, sound like. We've probably picked them up as kids. Who knows, we've maybe, maybe even eaten frog legs, you know, for dinner. Uh, certainly Lori has in France, because I know that's what the, yeah. <laughs> no, she's saying no. Okay, nonetheless. Yeah, frogs are well known. And we, as kids, we learn about them and we pick them up and then we learn things we shouldn't do. And God help us, some of us are old enough, enough to remember one of the reasons we have fewer leopard frogs out there than any other frog because we dissected them all in eighth grade biology, right? And that's, uh, that was part of the deal back then. So anyway, we've got uh, just a few species. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start the slideshow. So you don't have to look at my mug. You can look at something a little bit more. Um, okay. Honora, you, you need to enable me to <laughs> screen share. I know, right? Uh, okay. Try it again. You should be able to do it now. Sorry, it's uh, faulted uh, to There it is. Okay. So we'll do this and start right off. And um, <clears throat> hopefully you can hear some of the lovely sounds that um, <clears throat> these recordings that I have taken and some from Fishing Game to help give us a little audio background um, for those of you who, who just want to, you know, sit by that vernal pond and listen to peepers all night. Um, what a glorious idea, right? So frogs in New Hampshire, and <clears throat> first and foremost, they're in a class amphibia, right? The amphibians. And amphibio or I-O-M-P-H-I is Greek for surrounding both sides, double, two-sided. It refers to, of course, the aquatic phase and the upland phase of all amphibians. And interestingly, not all amphibians lay their eggs in water. And I, if this were a normal class, I would ask you, well, now, who knows which amphibians lay their eggs effectively on land, but there's water in the egg to allow for larval development. And of course, the correct answer is right down here, salamanders, the 
uh, order of caudata, but we're not talking about them today. We're just talking about anura, frogs and toads, anura. And we'll get to that very, very shortly. First, a little phylogeny, and I want you all to memorize this. There'll be an exam at the end of this program. This is the latest phylogeny. Well, what does that mean? It's sort of a DNA tree of how things originated and evolved. And when you start over here into the ancient amphibians 370 million years ago, give or take, I think it was on a Thursday. In any case, when you start back here, you have these old groups, the external gill containing Sicilians. Uh, that's not, they're not from Italy. No, they're, they're actually from the aquatic waters of, believe it or not, the Connecticut River. In our state, we've got a few that have been seen uh, in there, but also the ancient salamanders were really the oldest um, <clears throat> vertebrate organisms that arose from this ichthyostegia group uh, back in the Devonian. When you break it down, you notice on these two charts that basically three arrows. Makes it pretty simple for the Northeast in terms of what anurans we have. We have the hylidae, the tree frogs we'll talk about, bufonidae, which is uh, the family of toads, and then finally the ranids or true frogs, so to, so to speak, the ones that <clears throat> have all the typical frog characteristics. So when you look at a little bit more closely in terms of their life cycle, because this is kind of important. You know, typically they lay their eggs in the spring, as we've seen with the wood frogs when we talked about vernal pools. We also have seen the peepers, heard them, certainly if not seen them, and they've laid their eggs for the most part. But even right now, uh, towards the end of May, we're getting a lot of species that are um, actually laying their eggs as we speak, uh, in some water body nearby. And after the eggs are laid, as you can see in this common life cycle from the Nature Series poster, um, they develop into a tadpole. And again, for the most part, in terms of the true frogs in our neck of the woods, uh, these tadpoles are free living in aquatic waters and have, uh, as you can see, a large sort of head followed by a tail. After a little while, the hind legs point at poke out and they develop, then the front legs, and finally they lose their tail to be true anurans without tails in the adult stage on land. Um, you can see that the larvae vary in terms of how long it takes, 10 to 20 days, tadpoles a week and a half to two weeks, and that of course depends upon um, <clears throat> uh, how warm the waters are. For example, in vernal pools, um, generally, all of the metamorphos metamorphism in uh, frogs uh, depend upon temperature of the water in order to speed up or slow down. So it might take a little quite a while. Uh, we know that, for example, spotted salamanders take upwards of 60 days to develop from uh, the larval state to get to their juvenile state. But tadpoles can go a lot faster if you are, for example, in a vernal pool. That said, you can also have um, <clears throat> tadpoles that live as much as two or three years, and we'll talk about those guys uh, before they actually emerge as juveniles. They can disperse upwards of a mile. Uh, I, I, my hat's off to Brian Windmiller and others who have actually, actually put little radio collar sort of waistbands around frogs and tracked them through the woods. I think it'd be a fascinating thing to do. Um, and uh, GPS data on terms of how far they disperse from their natal sites and at least a mile, sometimes a mile and a half or even two miles away before they eventually return to their natal breeding site to do it again. And of course, all of our frog species have uh, constituents in their uh, cells. Uh, actually, Brooklyn glycol, if you ever heard of antifreeze, it's basically the same substance with a few other proteins attached. And those uh, <clears throat> chemicals allow the frogs to um, uh, overwinter without freezing. Uh, more than a couple of times I've poked underneath the snow on a January day and been lucky enough to find a frog just laying there absolutely catatonic, can't do anything, it's totally, you know, chilled down, uh, but not frozen, just real soft, real pliant, and that's how they overwinter. 
Uh, some are doing it in the terrestrial environment, like the wood frogs and others like green frogs and bullfrogs are actually underneath uh, the water in the sediment of a pond. So we'll start with toads. Um, Anaxiridae, formerly Bufonidae, uh, in that last chart. Uh, this is um, uh, by far our smallest uh, group of, of um, true frogs in the east. Uh, we only have about four or five species, uh, two of which occur in the northeast. Uh, and the most common, of course, is the eastern toad, Anaxiris americanus. And if you haven't seen this in the last year, Give your local permanent pond, gravel pit, uh, parking lot, detention basin, <laughs> they don't care where they breed. Give these guys a look in about two or three weeks and you'll see all these little tiny black tadpoles everywhere. Yeah, and that's, uh, that'll be toad, toad tadpoles. Um, you've got uh, a couple of things to uh, listen to in terms of toads and let's see if I can get this going. So you hear the peepers, the high notes, but if you can listen closely, in the back you hear that And that's the common toad, American toad, calling in this pond. You can see some lightning flashing in the background, perfect nights, one of those warm, humid, just about to thunderstorm kind of nights, and the toads and peepers are going wild. I love that sound. I could just go into La La Land listening to that all night. It's wonderful. So toads found throughout the eastern United States and Canada. Um, they are characterized by a parotid gland, which is these two bumps that you see between the eyes, the orbital sockets right there. And those parotid glands uh, really developed over, you know, a couple million years to provide predator defense, right? These chemicals in there, and there's a number of different chemicals that are isolated, are toxic to pretty much most wildlife, including us. Um, Tom Tining, one of my former amphibian mentors at, at Antioch, uh, he lives down in Holyoke, and Tom um, <clears throat> uh, used to take toads and to the unsuspecting student, squeeze the parotid gland and nail somebody in the face. <laughs> Sometimes, it sort of caught the lip and the lip would immediately burn. Personal experience, don't lick toads. I mean, yeah, okay, so maybe indigenous cultures in other parts of the world, namely South America, use toad venom as sort of mind altering uh, drugs, but nonetheless, I don't recommend it. You will not have a pleasant experience. It's pretty effective, that venom. They breed in mid to late spring, and they have really long, gelatinous, double-stranded masses of eggs. If you're lucky, um, in the next week or so, you could go to a pond and find these things. They're tiny blackish eggs, and you can barely see the gelatin, and they sort of looks like a long strand of DNA laying on the side of the, the pond. Um, they are explosive breeders, as many of our frogs are, and so you'll get, as you saw in that one picture, thousands and thousands of larvae in a pond and of course, I don't know what the numbers are, but you know, at least uh, uh, you know, one one thousandth of those uh, larvae are eventually going to survive and uh, make it to adulthood. Uh, toads are not usually in vernal pools, although certainly they can hang out in vernal pools uh, as adults. Uh, the other toad, the only other toad we have is this guy, the Fowler's toad. And Manixiris phaleri, formerly Bufo woodhousei, which was uh, named after a Massachusetts uh, botanist who, um, and zoologist, both, uh, Woodhouse uh, in the 19th century. Um, these guys are at their northern limit in New Hampshire. They're pretty much a southern coastal plain species. They are abundant uh, all throughout the middle Atlantic states, down into the Carolinas and into North Florida. They have this kind of nasal call. It's, um, you know, especially if your nose is stuffed up, it works. 
and they are therefore nothing like the American toad in terms of their calls. You cannot mistake in this. Um, a great place to see or hear um, Fowler's toads are in the Cape, is in the Cape. Um, there are a lot of ponds in the Cape, uh, sort of sand, what they call sand plain ponds, and that's just, they're absolutely heaven in terms of where they like to breed. Uh, their egg strands are shorter than the eastern toad. They lay a little bit in uh, later uh, the eggs into sort of late spring. Um, and they're so uncommon in, in our state, they're state listed as a special concern species. Or is a, actually a record for Center Harbor. I didn't, I didn't, hadn't read that before. I, I knew about the Hanover record. There's a couple in Manchester, Hookset, um, Strafford. Uh, there's a couple of towns in the coastal area, but in terms of the lakes region and north, yeah, good luck. You have to go a little farther south to see these guys. So that's the Fowlers, the other toad we have in New Hampshire. Then we jump into the Hylidae. These are the tree frogs. And as you can see in this picture, they're characterized by having toe pads that are effectively suction cups that allow them to climb vertical surfaces and hence they're common in trees. Um, not always in trees. Obviously, I got lucky with this guy um, and this one, both on the ground. So they'll come down to forage as most uh, frogs do, but they do have an, uh, these toe pads to adapt to living in higher parts of woody vegetation around the ponds they breed in, and that helps in their, um, their camouflage. As we know with uh, green frogs, um, they can actually change, excuse me, with uh, gray tree frogs, they can actually change their color. And this guy that was actually, was sitting here, I was waiting, because uh, it obviously it emerged from bark and was beginning to turn green. And by after about an hour or so, that color turned to about this shade. So it's amazing how fast they can actually change colors to adapt to their background. Uh, but in the juvenile state, they're bright lime green, and short of you know the camouflage of sitting there, in this case, it looks like a male berry, um, they blend in quite well. If they're out of their vegetation environment, like they might be in terms of on your house wall, <laughs> then they are easy to see. Uh, my friend Barry Draper took this great shot after raising some great tree frogs in his aquarium, and that's a, a picture of the larva. Um, they are, as uh, many folks know, um, uh, active once it gets a little bit warmer, generally 50 degrees, but give it to 60 or more, and then you'll start to hear gray tree frogs. They started vocalizing in the last couple of weeks in our region, and uh, we'll hear them all the way through into September, as long as it's warm enough. They breed in late spring, lay up over 2,000 eggs. It's amazing how many eggs they can produce, the females, uh, in clusters of up to 50. I can't tell you that I've seen good clusters of tree frogs. They're, um, you know, you have to really look for them. And the other thing is that in the ponds that they lay their eggs in, they typically do so under the vegetation or under leaves in the ponds. You have to actually rake through the leaves to find these eggs. A little bit tough to do. Um, and as, as this note uh, reminds, um, they're often seen around houses. After they emerge uh, from the ponds and become subadults or juveniles, the bright green color, they very commonly come to houses or your, like, you know, camps on your ponds or lakes or whatever, and, and uh, then they become very visible. Now I'm gonna just see if I can't test a, uh, a vocalization on these guys. I didn't have one in my own video shop, so, uh, I think I'm going to try and do another one in this case. Let's see if I can get it. That's northern leopard frog. Let's see if I can get to gray tree frog. There we go. So that's a, just an example of um, the great tree frog. And yeah, it's sort of an unmistakable trill-like arrangement. Um, oh, I think I just hit the wrong. Okay. Let's go back to here. Ah. 
Ah, it's over here. All right, technical difficulty. Uh, there we go. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next uh, frog is actually was thought to be in its own family, and after some DNA work, they realized the spring peeper is nonetheless a, an, a hylid. Um, we tend to call them narrow mouth frogs because they have narrow mouths, but again, as a hylid, they're actually a true tree frog. So a um, little bit of tax change once the DNA really sorted out where these guys belong. Spring keep peepers are nonetheless, well, spring peepers. This is at a lake, lakeside marsh near where I live. And if you've ever stood next to a few thousand peepers vocalizing at once, your brain too will probably explode. <laughs> peepers, of course, are well camouflaged. They have this X mark on their back. It's a little hard to tell sometimes, but generally that's um, present, hence the name crucifer for that cross pattern. Um, they do breed in the spring like most frogs. Uh, they only lay uh, one or two eggs, maybe a small group of eggs at a time under the leaf litter at the edge of these ponds that are tend to be permanent. They can also uh, lay eggs in vernal pools as well, uh, but up to a thousand eggs again. It's amazing the fecundity of these guys. And I suppose if you're at a spring peeper pond in the evening you yeah it's easy to imagine it's, it sounds like there might be a thousand of course it's probably just a couple hundred you know just to blind your ears as it were uh, they're found throughout uh, eastern north america and are pretty widespread um, <clears throat> they disperse like wood frogs and other types of true frogs uh, widely into the upland environment after emerging as, as sub-adults and you can find them just virtually miles from from water so we get into the ranids. I threw this slide up just to show you how uh, close some of the DNA is. Um, <clears throat> these are, of course, the amino acid building blocks and nucleotides from a strand of DNA that is used for identifying these particular, this particular group, the ranids, um, from each other. And you can see there's just a couple of um, nucleotide uh, members that are different in a couple of the chains. They're very, very close. And yet it's enough, uh, perhaps as close as 99.5% to each other, to have distinguishing characteristics. Here we see just the five species with sort of Rana sabbatica being the apparent uh, more ancestral member of this group. Uh, not shown here is the mink frog, which we'll talk about as well. So wood frog. Absolutely, right? These are just classic, classic members of our spring fauna. Um, we have eggs here on the right. It's commonly laid as grapefruit-sized clusters, upwards of 3,000 eggs if you have a really big cluster, but more typically about 500 to 600 eggs in a cluster. And they're colonial in the sense that the females and males all congregate in these masses in vernal pools and lay their eggs and lay their eggs in one location. And if you've done a bunch of vernal pool sort of surveys, you come to the conclusion that um, A, wood frogs are the earliest in. They generally beat uh, spotted salamanders by, by a week or two. And sometimes they'll lay in sooner than blue spotted salamanders or Jeffersons, which are pretty early. Um, nonetheless, uh, it really varies in terms of how fast or how quickly they uh, develop into embryos and then emerge as tadpoles, as you see in this image right here, the classic sort of square or what I call blocky structure of the tadpole, which is pretty distinct. It's the only one that really looks like it is a pickerel frog, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute, but that's a classic wood frog. Tadpole, they start off very, very dark, uh, almost the same color as toad tadpoles, but the shape is very different. And as they develop, you'll see that blockiness uh, be accentuated. This is a male wood frog. And uh, when you 
you know, consider males are generally about 50 to 60 percent the size of females. They become easier to identify and distinguish from females. They also have sort of a pinkish cast. Um, so here's an, uh, here's an example of another site that I went to this last year with wood frogs calling. Beaver pond, wildwood. Big vernal pool. And that site was, um, you could be, it was hard to hear, it was not a great recording, but you could see that wood duck kind of call of the wood frog, hence um, I think one of the reasons it got its name. Um, it does sound like a duck and you can hear them uh, several hundred yards away in the woods and it's one way that um, uh, some folks like myself do uh, uh, vernal pool surveys is by walking transects and and doing at least two recordings, uh, directional recordings of the sounds of wood frogs. So you can pinpoint the approximate location of these guys as you're walking through the woods. Um, this pond that I showed a picture of uh, was actually uh, um, a forested swamp and um, beavers came in, the first beavers that had been in there since the early 1900s, uh, you know, they had been trapped out after that. And within one year, I counted over a thousand wood frogs after the first inundation took place. And it was sort of incredible to think that this is a pond, this is a swamp that had not been inundated for over a hundred years. And in that amount of time, had that many wood frogs sort of, you know, smell the roses and come downhill to this thing. It was just amazing. Um, and it's still, this, this was taken 20 years after it became a pond and there were still lots of wood frogs and salamanders in there. Oh, I wanna go back and just show you, this is a wood frog mass, just so that you can see that there's no external gelatinous coating. Whereas when you have spotted salamanders, you can actually see there's a external coating around the entire mass. And notice how nice and round the spotted is. And when you have blue spotted, there's also a coating, but there's far fewer eggs and there's a little bit more space between the individual embryos in the blue spotted salamander. So this is a pretty good shot of all three of them occurring together. So wood frogs, like I said, the, one of the earliest to emerge. Um, I grew up, my grandfather called them state troopers. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> it was, I think, because of this uh, black stripe through the eye. Um, just, a just one of the colloquial names of this thing. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, you have upwards, up to 3,000 eggs per mass, but usually in the several hundreds. Um, and then emerging and dispersing uh, upwards of two or three miles away from the natal site. Um, and it begins to, you know, you can start thinking about vernal pool conservation and what we, how we ha treat our habitat and the fragmentation thereof and, and how challenging it can be for some of these guys to get back to their natal pools after uh, the land around it has been developed. So also in the spring, but a little bit later, we start seeing pickerel frogs. And notice that in the pickerel frog, you have this double line of squarish, spots down the back and then you've got some square spots on the sides and a little bit more regular pattern on the legs. The egg masses look very similar to an old spotted salamander egg mass. They're just you have to look a little close if you're in a pond that could have had spotted in there but they will develop later because these guys are just starting to get into the breeding season right now. Uh, pickle frogs are a little bit later. Um, that coppery color is pretty diagnostic. Sometimes it can be a, sort of washed out a little bit, more pale tannish with dark blackish brown spots, but that contrast between those square spots and the back is really good. Um, the tadpoles can be a little variable. Uh, here you have sort of the dark back, light underneath side. Here's a, a tadpole that's fairly new, that's fairly light altogether, and here's a dark one. So they can be variable, and that makes it a little trickier to identify tadpoles of pickerel frog and segregate those from wood frog. 
Um, it's rare when they overlap in terms of where they breed. So, you know, generally speaking, you're, you're almost always in a vernal pool um, or a big skitter rut uh, if you're a wood frog. But if you're a pickle frog, you're in a permanent water body. Uh, they too can lay up to 3,000 eggs per mass, uh, typically smaller, at least in my experience. And the larvae generally emerge by late fall, but they can actually overwinter. And we'll get into some of the other frogs that do that on a regular basis. But here's one aspect, and I don't know how many of you lick frogs, but yeah, don't want to lick a pickerel frog. Just saying. All right, mink frog. I, again, were we in person to person? Asked how many people have seen these and where you've seen them and so forth. This is actually a state listed species. And if you uh, come across this sort of camo pattern of blackish spots uh, on a bright green background, take note. And I would encourage you to get on to the wildlife sightings database that Fish and Game main maintains and enter that record because not unlike. Um, some of our frogs, certainly not as, as drastic as, as leopard frogs, but these guys are disappearing. Um, I noticed more than when I was growing up. I only have a handful of records from Grafton County, uh, Northern Carroll County, and Coas County. Um, and, you know, they're, of course, a, a pretty much a boreal forest species uh, all the way out to the Midwest, Upper, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and Minnesota. But they aren't that common, and I, I've done a fair amount of work in the Adirondacks, and um, they're also listed in New York, uh, being a, pretty much the only place that they occur is in the Adirondacks. Um, they do have a musky smell, which is almost mink-like. If you've ever handled a mink or smelled a mink, that's kind of a musky odor, and that's similar to what you get when you handle a mink frog. Um, <clears throat> they're breeding, they probably won't be breeding until early June. Again, things are a little bit slower up north in most years, and um, that's, that's the time when they really start to go into their cold, otherwise cold ponds and, and breed. So, uh, mink frog, Lithobates septentrionalis. Septentrionalis means uh, sort of northern. Okay, green frogs. Well, I mean, who hasn't seen a green frog? This is by and large our most common frog. Um, Here's a whole slew of tadpoles that I got in one sweep of the dip net. Very easy to do, especially when they're, when they're in confined uh, ponds. And they have these dorsolateral ridges, which run down behind the orbital socket, all the way down the side of the back. And that helps you segregate them from bullfrog, which would be their closest sort of relative in terms of size and shape. Um, they also have a very different sort of banjo-like pluck um, in terms of their calls. Uh, you know, it's like <coughs> something like that. I'm not doing it justice. Um, maybe my video will help a little bit. But notice that the, the tympanum, which is this ear membrane, is, is about the same size in the female. But if you have a male, it's a little bit larger than the eye. And that's one way to tell the, the sexes apart, uh, which, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, you cannot do easily in all of our frog species. Certainly wood frog is easy, and, but peepers, hmm, good luck with that. Uh, up to 5,000 eggs at once, and this is one of the species, um, which is why I was able to collect these larvae in April, um, tadpoles over winter, and they take upwards of two years to mature into emerging sub-adults. So this one you have to give a little listen to because it's there's not as many wood frogs as I would like to have playing. Yeah, can't really hear it that well. Oh well. I'm sure you've all heard the banjo sounds of the wood frog. Ah, there was a peeper. <laughs> all right, so the uh, next, to, I think it's the next to last species is the leopard frog. And this one um, is pretty characteristic in terms of the spots. 
it does have the same size as a green frog, but notice it doesn't really have a greenish face uh, like the mink or the green frog or the bullfrog. Um, it's more tannish colored, but it can be green. These are pretty variable. Our northern ones tend to be darker than the southern leopard frog, uh, but these roundish spots are characteristic. So it's really hard to mistake in it for any other frog. Once you look at those roundish spots, in this case, you've got a sort of a green ring surrounding the dark spots. Um, and that's pretty, pretty classic. Those spots can be elongate and you might see dorsolateral ridges and think, oh, it's a green frog. But then you look again at the spots themselves. It's, they're not squarish, they're roundish. And, um, and that gives away the leopard frog. Um, these guys have disappeared, as I said. There's a chytrid fungus that's a water mold um, and that has been um, affecting them. There's, of course, habitat loss. We've lost in not so much in the Northeast, but in other parts of the country, uh, our leopard frogs have disappeared from introduced species, particularly in the Gulf states. Um, and so they are listed now as a, a special concern species. And in my opinion, they should be listed as threatened. I, I think they're rare enough that um, we should go ahead and just treat them as a threatened species in the state, uh, which add, may add a little bit of protection to them if, if we have um, any development proposals for large floodplains, um, which is where they tend to occur most commonly. This picture was taken down at the, the Canterbury uh, river wash, um, I think Riverside something, uh, conservation land that the town owns on the Merrimack River. Um, and that uh, the other one was from the Connecticut River. So I've only really seen them, uh, well, not only, but I've mostly seen them in floodplains. Um, and these guys do have a pretty characteristic um, <clears throat> uh, snoring uh, sound. And see if I can get back to get back to that. Come on. Have to get that. There's mink frog. It's there we go. All right. Northern leopard frog. Yeah, that's pretty different. And while we're here, since it takes a little bit to get this, here's the mink frog, which is also quite a bit different than green frog. Pretty cool, huh? You can get this right on the Fish and Game website. They have a section on species, species occurring in Hampshire. Uh, hit the amphibians and boom, select it and you get these great recordings. So, mink frog, something that you may have to climb up into the White Mountains to hear. All right, so we'll do, uh, finish this up. <clears throat> All right, so we have also um, in the green frog uh, a sort of group, but uh, that is to say similar green frog, the bullfrog, Lithobates uh, catespiana. And that's uh, our largest frog. It has, um, you know, these, this bright green coloration, and that can be variable. You'll see in this emerging uh, sub-adult here, almost, and we've got front legs coming out, back legs are well-developed, the tail's still he intact, that's kind of a brownish olive gray color, which can be a lot like the green frog in terms of their emerging. You also look at the tadpole, and that almost looks like a green frog, except it's about twice as big. <laughs> and there's also a much sharper sort of rounded uh, uh, apical end to the body of the polywog, as it were. And these guys um, are the longest lived. Um, I've certainly documented three years of life as a polywog or larva, um, but they say they can actually um, do uh, sort of live in that state for five years before they emerge in this condition right here. 
So <clears throat> bullfrogs also very, very common. Um, they have that unmistakable jug of rum call, um, lay upwards of 8,000 eggs. So very uh, prolific. Um, and as I said before, when they overwinter, they'll burrow down into the muck of the pond, uh, permanent pond or lake uh, that they're living in. Um, I have seen them cruise through vernal pools, but uh, typically that's a, a midsummer type, early summer type event where adults are just uh, dispersing, um, perhaps looking for new breeding locales, um, but they're not, you know, uh, going to have enough water in there to certainly to survive. They could not tolerate uh, the benthic environment of a vernal pool like, you know, fairy shrimp or uh, um, the other most common salamander we have there are marbled salamanders. So these guys are pretty common. They're all over the map. So frogs are absolutely fun and easy to study. Kids love them, but just don't count on the prince to arrive. All right. Thank you very much. There's a couple of books here I always like to uh, point people to for those of us old folks that are still book readers. <laughs> um, you know, Peterson Field Guide, Tom Tining's uh, Stokes Guide, Jim Taylor's Amphibians and Reptiles of New Hampshire, which is still good, even though it's a little out of date. And of course, uh, DeGraff and Rudis, uh, Amphibians and Reptiles in New England is sort of a, a condensation of a clip from the New England Wildlife uh, book that they have. There's some great online uh, stuff, fishing game websites, probably my favorite in terms of go-to source of information for these guys. So, all right, I will stop the share and take questions as it were. And Nora's gonna mute, unmute everybody, I think. I have a question, Rick. Sure. So uh, I've never like bullfrog eggs and green frog egg. Are they singly laid? Or are they in clumps? No. Are they? Yeah, big, big clusters. Um, they tend to be pretty long. Okay, in the green frog, the ones I've seen, uh, bullfrogs are more or less amorphous masses. Hard to see because what I find is that as soon as they hit the bottom in the time of year, yeah, they get covered to, with sort of pond out, scum and yeah. muck and silt. So it's almost like you can see some of the uh, like spotted salamander oh, yeah. eggs now that have muck and silt yeah. covering them in yeah. these pools. So they get camouflaged up pretty quickly. Yeah. But yeah, there's otherwise they're very typically, you know, no gelatinous sheath, just lumpy masses. So what I've seen. Last year at the annual meeting, I remember, was that last year? We found a peeper egg. I had never seen a oh, peeper egg before. That was oh, very cool. That's hard to find. You, it was you. You, we were. Was I the one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there yes, are in one of the vernal pools at Tin Mountain. It was very oh, cool. God, yeah. they are yeah. hard to find. You got to look yeah. for them. You know, yeah. I think I've seen two or three. You know, but they're there. You just have to look for them. Yeah. You know, who's out mucking through ponds when the mosquitoes are eating them alive? You know. Yeah. That's <laughs> Other cool. questions. Um, Rick, I have a question for sure, you. Nor. Um, can you talk about what um, you know? What these different frogs are eating? Are they essentially? <laughs> Um, you know, do they have similar diets? Do they specialize on specific things? Well, the big mouth frog, you know, um, you have different food sources at different life sta stages, of course. Um, as unhatched embryos, they're eating their cell cytoplasm and the proteins and stuff in there. When they hatch out as tadpoles, they're pretty much grazing as detritivores, right? Uh, Al there's a lot of algae, there's a lot of sort of pond microorganisms that coat the benthic parts and the edges of twigs and leaves of grass. And you can see that stuff. You take a grass leaf that's underwater and just slide your fingers up and you'll get a whole bunch of stuff. That's what they're eating as tadpoles. All right. And so it's not just, you know, so people say, well, you know, 
uh, bullfrog tadpoles are, are predators. No, they're grazers. And so they're going to eat both animal and plant and probably fungi, you know, water from old stuff as well as they, as they graze along. As they get a, older as adults, they're pretty much turning to now more predatory habits. They're eating aquatic invertebrates. Um, they're eating even eggs of birds if they can get them and bullfrogs are well known to have done that there was somebody took a picture of a bullfrog flapping out at a hummingbird flying by i mean we know that they dragonflies but a hummingbird now that's that's a catch yeah <laughs> your bullfrog going after a hummingbird so but they are largely predatory as adults um the r wider ranging terrestrials like wood frogs are going to be eating a lot of pill bugs, a lot of aquatic or um, terrestrial invertebrates, millipedes, snails, slugs, that kind of food source is what the wood frogs go after. So pretty much invertebrates uh, with a few exceptions. It's a good question. Great. Hey Rick, um, a couple of years ago I was out at Mountain Pond, you know, we were doing loon surveys. And I noticed these, I, I, I can only tell you they were like giant tadpoles. They were, they were like the size of silver dollars. Yeah. And there were, there were a lot of them in the water. I was thinking, gee, if I'm a loon, I'd like this place. But you, you think those were a bullfrog? Bullfrogs, yeah. Tad, tadpoles, for sure. Yeah, I've actually, actually seen them up there. Mountain okay. Pond's a great spot. Um, and, you know, the herons just can't keep up with them. You know, they, <laughs> they can eat only so many well yeah <laughs> so, i mean they but, really were sizable i'd never seen anything like that before it was interesting now if any of you have ever eaten uh bullfrog tadpoles i'd be very curious to know i've never that's a wild food source that i've never really thought about <laughs> consuming <laughs> yeah leg meat maybe but <laughs> tadpoles no 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 okay i've had frogs legs they were great yeah frog legs are great yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. So along that line of eating, uh, us, or, no, not us as people, but eating tadpoles, I know that you said for at least some of them that their skin is toxic. So are the tadpoles themselves toxic to birds or fish if they eat them? Uh, that I don't know. I know the adult, um, you know, as I said, pickerel frog is toxic, um, but I actually do not know if there are any tadpoles that are toxic. Um, certainly consumed by fish, certainly consumed by loons and herons and ducks, and there are a number of waterfowl that will eat tadpoles, but I don't, I don't know of any. And if anyone here knows of, of that, uh, feel free to speak up. I'd love to know that answer. I thought I've seen um, dogs eating tadpoles. <laughs> there was a pool of them and they were just there in there and I was just amazed that they were just lipping, licking them all up. So I was surprised wow. to see the, the dogs eating them. What, what happened 10 minutes later? <laughs> see what happened 10 minutes later. I just, <laughs> I was concerned, you know, I said, oh my God, they're eating all the, the frogs. <laughs> oh my word. Wow. Like bobbing for apples, I suppose. Yeah. I'll, I'll, oh. I have a comment to make sure, that um, there's a certain time of year, maybe in another three, four weeks, I can't remember when, when um, I take walks through the woods every day. And there's a certain time of year when you got to watch your feet because the little itty bitty baby toads are out everywhere. And my sister and I call them insectile toadlets because they're <laughs> so small. <laughs> and, then, and then we're just obsessed with watching where we're placing our feet. It's just like, oh no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would guess that if, if they're the little, you know, just little tiny, tiny guys, like about that big. Smaller it's, even. It's even smaller. Wow. Oh, sometimes, wow. yeah. Wow, then it's yeah. gotta be, you know, sometime in late June, early July. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. That, you know, because that's about four weeks into on an average temperature, you know, eggs laid mid to late May. It's about right, four to six weeks. So, 
Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Is there everything something? starts small? That's oh, what I'm always yeah, reminding kind of, myself. <laughs> is there some kind of uh, condition that makes a bullfrog turn into a frog after several years? Is it good conditions that will make them turn into a frog? Or yeah, what? that's a that's a good question. I I think there are probably several different factors. You know, if you think about bullfrogs occupying uh, a perennial pond environment or even a lake shore that the water temperature is going to have an effect the amount of an abundance of food for the polywogs to eat is going to have an effect uh, there might be even some predator pressure that may play a part in it relative to say if you have a predator eating a lot of your competitors you've got thousands of brothers and sisters out there and the and the predator takes out 90% of them, there's more food for you. <laughs> and there's actually less chance that you'll get eaten. So that might speed things. There are a lot of factors. I, I can't pinpoint it. But like I said, three to five years, that's a long, long time as a larva uh, in larval state. There are some salamanders that, that go that long as, as larvae. Uh, and certainly we know the, the red aft, for example, will have a three to seven year lifespan as a juvenile before it's a breeding adult. So but I don't, I don't know specific, you know, specifically. It's a good question. Do they take so long in southern places? I've always thought that, like, you know, bullfrogs and green frogs in mm -hmm. the south don't it, go through it much quicker, like in yeah. two years. Versus yeah, they have uh, actually two breeding seasons in the south for green and bullfrog. Wow. And I was, I was reading because I, I wasn't sure about this, but there's, a, I think a pickerel frog, if I'm not mistaken, also can have a double breeding season down there in the, hmm. in the south, Gulf states yeah. and Florida. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's going to speed things up with the temperature. Yeah. I mean, sure. around here, it just, yeah. yeah. Uh, Around Rick, here, we could have snow in July. <laughs> Rick, a follow-up question to the about the small toads hiking up the Crawford Path and, and some of the other high peak uh, trails. I've come across in that late June, July period, tiny, I mean, maybe a quarter inch, no more than less than half an inch sized frogs and in, in, in that. So what would, what would they be again? I, I missed on that. Well, it, it, you know, toads. The toads, toads, toads. toads or wood frogs. Wood frogs are pretty hefty dispersers. Uh, the green frogs don't, my observation is that they don't disperse as much when they're small as they do when they're just before they breed. Like, you know, probably about four to five years old on a green frog. And then we can see them. I've had them on the tops of mountains that are dry as a bone, you know, no, no water nearby kind of thing. Um, so, but probably I think toads would be my first guess, and then wood frog number two is the most likely culprit on the Crawford path. Yeah. If I have a photo, I'll send it to you, Laurie, and you can yeah. Go on yeah, for it. please do. Yeah. You know where I hang out. Mm -hmm. So we hiked up uh, Sabatis over in Lovell probably three weeks ago, yeah, in a month, a month, maybe even a month ago. <laughs> And we were up above a very small body of water, and there was something that we had no idea what it was, but it was froggish, and it sounded like those mink frogs. Would that make sense? Oh yeah. That How, what's the elevation up there, Tom? It's not very high. I don't know off the top of my head. But, but Sabatis is. Um, yeah. Not sure. I mean, we have mink frogs um, in Conway. Yeah. That's so, and I think that's about as far south. Uh, I heard tell there was one up at Guinea Pond, but I haven't seen it. That's in Sandwich, and that's at about 2,800 feet, if I'm not mistaken, elevation. Oh, yeah. So that'd be about it, but I don't know about Sabatis. Yeah. But if you if you document it, take a picture and then send it in. Okay. The, the little body of water was pretty far below us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was the noise. It, it was making a very different frog type sound that we had no idea what it was. Yeah, well, that cuck, 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 cuck. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cuck, 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 cuck. You know, that's pretty good for mink frogs. Not a lot of frogs that make that sound. It was, it was different. We weren't sure what it was. Hmm. I'll be darned.
All right. Anybody else? I can play some more spring paper <laughs> music to put us all to sleep. <laughs> but I think we're good to go. Thank you very much for your time. Thank um, you, Rick. Great, yeah. Thank you, Rick. Come yeah. on. Yay. Yeah, Yay. put that clap, yeah, put that claps, you know, right there. <laughs> yeah. we'll all hit those go claps. Out and we'll all go out yeah. and listen to to what's uh, what's making yeah. what's making noise. Yeah, tonight, good night our, to go out. Um, yes, yeah, so yes, and thank you again for doing this. And if folks are looking for something to do next Thursday, we'll have um, you know, as I said, Olivia Saunders from New Hampshire from. UNH Cooperative Extension presenting on bees and other backyard pollinators. Yeah, nice. All right. Yes, but thank you all for tuning in. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Yeah. Night. Yep. Night now.